Uh, hello? Oh, okay. Yeah, I wasn't sure whether my <clears throat> my sound was working. All right, we'll get started in maybe a minute or two. Post the uh, community meeting notes and the uh, messages here. get started um so just wanted to say that the uh i think that joining this meeting means that uh, you know the participation of the uh, cncf um forget the exact wording someone else <laughs> yeah, take that. yeah I, I i can do that yeah so uh uh this meeting is being recorded it'll be uploaded yeah. to youtube at, at some point in the future and your your participation in this meeting is an agreement to abide by um, the open SSF code of conduct. Um, there is also uh, should be attached to the meeting notes um, some information just about about a, a uh, uh, you know all, also participation in this meeting falls under like a, a Linux antitrust policy. If you could write this in the go off meeting notes at the top so that people yeah. <laughs> people yeah, yeah, that are I not used definitely. to announcing this, I could just uh, have it for reference. <laughs> yep. This this is almost like um as as familiar as sneezing to Mike, you know, it just comes right <laughs> out. <laughs> yeah, I think people who are used to running the working group meetings and stuff, yeah. <laughs> um, all right, awesome. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, so uh, if there's anybody new on the call that would want to that, that would like to introduce themselves, uh, please do so. Um, you can also, you know, please add your name to the, the community meeting uh, notes that I that are posted here in the uh, in the Google uh, oh, the Zoom messages here. Hi everyone, I am Alex. I'm from Microsoft, and I actually just joined Microsoft a couple months ago. Um, but yeah, looking forward to learn more about Guac. Awesome, nice to meet you, Alex. Awesome. Um, by any chance, can you share a little bit about which which team you're on, what have you been looking into? Yeah, so I'm on the Azure Container Registry team, currently focusing on our container secure supply chain efforts. Um, so I'm mainly here to investigate where and to what extent we can integrate Guac into our supply chain for our first party and our third party customers. Awesome. Uh, by any chance, are you on the same team as uh, Ridwan? Uh, yes, I yeah, oh, I just started awesome. working with them. Cool. cool. Awesome. Hi, I'm Kanchan Thamli. Uh, I work in a guide work and I work on a project related to security supply chain. So yeah, I, I would like to know more about the GOG here. Yeah, we use GOG also in our project. Awesome. Yeah. Welcome. Hey, Kanchan. All right, um, anybody else? Oh, we can get started. Yeah, hi, I am Arvind. Uh, I am part of the Ortelius community. I just came here to like contribute to this project. Awesome, good to have you. All right, so uh, first thing on the agenda is actually uh, uh, is going to give a quick demo and, and and actually talk through some of the changes that we've been making on the Glock side. Now the demo, uh, we have a bunch of 
bunch of demos on the agenda as well as you know at, at the end we have an open discussion so if there's anything else you know anybody on the call would like to chat about more any questions or would more like to get more information uh please do so uh please ask oh so first thing uh so first thing on the agenda is the the blob store and pops up so i can start talking about this so one of the things we were um there was an issue that was open for a long time in guac uh with regards to um you know, we, we use a pub sub in, bet uh, in between different collectors and ingesters. But the problem is sometimes the SBOMs or, you know, some of these documents could be pretty massive. And, uh, you know, the pub sub has a limit in terms of what kind of a size of a message you can send across of it. So, you know, there was a thought process as we should probably add some type, type of some type of a blob store where we could, you know, uh, store these different documents there and then use that and send the actual key, you know, uh, as, a, as an event via the pub sub so that it can be picked up and ingested uh, later on. This also allows us the, you know, the guac, the capability of storing all these at these documents, attestations, whatever, right, into one centralized location so that if in the future, uh, you know, users wanted to look it up or wanted the actual original document back, right, it's stored in one location. So I think that's, that was the thought process around it. So the, the uh, doing that process, doing our research, you know, we figured, we just, uh, we found uh, GoCloud and GoCloud has the capability of abstracting out uh, the blob store as well as the pub sub, meaning, uh, and I can pull up some documentation here, but what this allows us to do, and uh, let me pull it up here. I can share my screen. I think you show this off and here it is. So what this allows us to do is uh, we can actually abstract out, uh, you know, in terms of what blob store is actually used. Uh, so in the example I'm going to show off in the demonstration, you know, we're using an S3 bucket, uh, for example, but at the same time, it's very quickly based on, just based on the, uh, it's basically this, uh, what do you call that, the connection string in terms of how the connection string is specified. You know, you can specify Azure, you can specify, you know, uh, uh, AWS, Google Cloud, whatever kind of thing, you can, or a local storage if you wanted to. Um, so have all that kind of stuff, stuff set up. So basically makes it agnostic, right? So you can have any kind of, any kind of storage you would, would like to see. Uh, same, similarly, uh, we did this uh, similar thing for the pub sub and the pub sub, as you can see here, has the ability, you know, I think initially we were using NATS and I think a lot of, a lot of people in the community asked like, hey, you know, could, you know, we worked a lot more, we work with Kafka, you know, we have AWS, we work in an Azure environment, you know, can we use our own, uh, you know, can we use the pub subs that are provided there? Like we don't want to be tied to NATS, you know, bring up NATS. So now what happens is, uh, now you're, because of this, you know, we can make it again, agnostic. So by default, NATS still comes up. So if you just want to play around with it or do whatever you want, you know, you don't have to spin up your own uh, pub sub service. NATS will come up by default and you can use, use uh, Guac like normal. But if you wanted to, you know, use Azure, if you wanted to use AWS, SQS and so forth, right? All that stuff, again, can be done relatively quickly. And again, it's all it is, is a connection string. Uh, you, you know, you, you set up the, the SQS in your AWS environment or whatever it is. And then you pass in the connection string, and it's it's good to go. So um, so it's the, it's a lot like it makes the Guac much more flexible for people to deploy into like a production environment. So the thing I'll show off here, <clears throat> and let me get this started here. All right, so sharing my console. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to bring up, I'm going to run, uh, run Guac as individual pieces just to show it off. But you can imagine this, like, uh, you know, if we're running in a Docker Compose, all this, all this would be configurable and you could pass in the different, you know, uh, you could pass in the connection string you would want for the, you know, the, the blob store or the pub sub kind of thing. But just to show it off in this demonstration purposes, I'm going to run them separately just to show the different components all connected together. Um, we, we, we still have to make some updates to the, um, the documentation to uh, account for this. So this is not in the latest release, version zero, uh, version zero point four. But I think, in the, but in the next release, you know, we'll update the documentation, and this will be all live and and ready to go. So the first thing I'll do is just get the, uh, oops. The so first thing I'll do is just get the uh, the GraphQL server running, and I'm just going to use a key value backend in this case. Um, so you know the just to, for the demonstration purposes. The next thing I'll do here is I'm gonna get the R 
get my ingester uh, started. So you can see in here, uh, I'm calling the guac ingest. And so I'm specifying a blob address, uh, which is this S3 bucket here. And then I'm also specifying a pub sub address, which is going to be the SQS that I already set up. And what I've done in the background is also I've authenticated into my AWS environment. So this is something, again, the Go Cloud kind of takes care of, takes care of for us is that you don't have to do any kind of authentication as long as you're authenticated, as long as the you know you, the, the session you're in or, or you pass in a specific environment variable, it takes care of the authentication for us. So once I run this, as long as I didn't time out of my thing, I shouldn't have. Now, there you go. So once I, it, it goes through, you know, it connects to the S3 bucket, it connects to the SQS, and now it's ready to receive. Uh, so what I'll do from the collector side now, so I'm going to call the guac one collect or guac, guac collect, which is going to connect again to the same th same S3 bucket, as well as the same address for the pub sub. And I'm going to, I'm going to uh, load in the uh, guac data docs, as you can see here. So once I kick this off, uh, we can come back over here to the ingestion side. So this this went through successfully, and I'll come here, and I should see this start populating, um, start giving me messages saying that it's ingesting into the in-memory database. So again, you can think, think of this if you wanted to use the, you know, if you wanted to use a Google Cloud bucket, if you wanted to use the Google's pub sub, you know, all those kind of things. It's, again, all it is is a connection string, and as long as, long as you're authenticated, um, in that environment, you're, it'll be good to go. So that completed. Uh, so you can see. So what I can do here, just to show off, like, hey, uh, you know, it, it got it got ingested properly. Is I'll just run this uh, query known package command here, and for the specific vault uh, image that I have, and it's going to come back and say, like, oh yeah, there's an S bomb located in this location. Um, I think one of the things we'll do is right now it's still pointing back to, <clears throat> you know, where it came from orig originally. But we can update this to be like, hey, now the SBOM download location. You know, if we if we decide to keep the the uh, S3 or the Blob Store, pers uh, you know, uh, persistent or you know, not delete all this, uh, not delete the documents after they've been ingested, you can change this location to be point to that S3 location. So this way, you always have a location of like, hey, yeah, that's where it's actually stored. If I ever want to go back, so not you know, not where you downloaded it from, but where in that centralized Blob Store that it kind of ends up at. Um, any questions? Yeah, oh yeah, I have a one question. So uh, okay. in one of the query, you uh, executed query and where you specified the SC bucket and the AWS SQL set. So that pro mm -hmm. process will be a long running process. So uh, will we face some issue if we, if that process runs for a days or um, months? Or we need to restart that again. Me, like in yeah. terms of an authentication, or what do you mean? I guess. Uh, not authentication. Means generally, what happens uh, if we run a process for a long time, a while loop or mm -hmm. something? So, uh, because of some memory issue or something, it get mm -hmm. crashed sometimes. So I was just curious. Uh, will that happen in that case also? Yeah, so I think like, so. What I did is I ran this in you know the straight on my machine kind of thing. But you would probably want you'd be running this in a Docker Composer or a Kubernetes environment, right? If the if the command ever fails, right, then you probably want to restart that service or restart that pod, right? Okay. So that's how it'd be utilized in in an actual environment, right? You wouldn't be running. That's that's why I mentioned in the, the beginning of the demo is like I'm showing you this off in pieces just to show like you know what it looks like. But you would be actually running this like once we get the like I think the Docker Compose has been updated, but not the the Helm charts yet. But so once the new release, once we put out a new release, we'll update those as well as the documentation. So you would be running in that environment, right? So you can put a probably put like a health check or something in there if the if that pod ever crashes or if the service ever stops pulling or fa or fails, right? You can restart that as you need. And because you're using a pub sub, okay. right? Yeah. Um, you can you can you're not gonna you can have at least at least like at least on the SQS, right? It's uh, at least once delivery, right? So it, requ it requires an acknowledgement in order for the for the queue to, you know, to, in order for the message to be uh, emptied from the queue. So you're not losing anything. So for example, if the the collector is still running but the ingester fails for whatever reason, the collector is going to send it to the queue. It's going to sit there in the queue until the ingester comes back up alive again and starts ingesting. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that was actually my concern. It means if that process fails, we will miss out some data. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's what the, the pub sub has to do. Right. So 
it, like you're right, that's what I meant. Like in, in a AWS SQS at least, right? It's in always once. Say, same with NATS. NATS, NATS we use Jetstream. So it's an, uh, it's a, sorry, it's an at least once delivery, meaning that it guarantees one delivery, right? Of that specific document or the message. Um, same with SQS. So as long as you're using a service that has the same capability, then it shouldn't be an issue. Okay, okay. thank you. Any other questions? That is super cool. And I think it solves a lot of our problems, especially with like the, the limited size we initially were having with like um, putting in uh, entire S forms that were bigger than 64 megabytes into a pub sub. And yep. just like now the whole management of the blob saw and the, the pub sub, like you said, you know, if you, you have a service provider that guarantees you that you don't have to worry about running your own uh, kind of uh, approved pub sub within the infrastructure. So this, this is super cool. Mm -hmm. All right, so we will move on to the next topic. Uh, so Nathan uh, is gonna talk about the most critical dependency so one of the things that he's been working on, um, he has mentioned that he can't demo it because I think he, you know, uh, the demo gods uh, kind of cried out and broke <laughs> <laughs> broke it right before the, the community meeting. But I think uh, he'll be able to show off like, you know, what the thought process is, you know, the output and kind of talk through it. Nathan? Okay. Um, hi, I'm Nathan, an intern Kasari and a active contributor to Guac. Um, like Parth said, the demo got struck me and I, uh, don't really have a demo, but I do have the output. Um, but before I show you guys the output, let me just give you a quick explanation of what this does. Um, so the point of this feature, the next actual critical dependency is to show you where to allocate your resources. Um, this finds the projects that are the most dependent. Uh, the least secure and, well, in the end, I guess, the most critical. Um, the idea is to have a REST endpoint to calculate the number of dependents for each package. And then after that, have a couple more endpoints that calculate the scorecard score and the vulnerability information for these packages. Um, currently, I've got a PR out for this but it's only of the first part. Uh, this PR calculates the number of dependents for each package. And when I say the number of dependents for a package, I mean the number of packages that depend on a current package or on our given package. Um, so including the rest endpoint for this and the endpoints for the scorecard score and vulnerability information will be added in follow-up PRs. Uh, just saying, um, you know what, let me just show you the code. So the code is uh, kind of complicated. So I ran up a design doc to uh, explain that. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So the code is kind of complicated because we go up the tree and then back down the tree for every package. And I've written up a design doc to uh, help explain that with an example. Um, and I don't really want to explain it now because it'll take some time. But, um, well, since I can't, I don't really have a demo per se, I can show you a part of the output. The output is here. The output itself is pretty long, but this, let's put in the chat, is what, so like the number of dependents to the package name is, I'm just giving that as an output right now, but for Guac Data Docs, there are the, the package with the most dependents is Step Debian, which has 41, uh, dependents, like for, no, 41 packages depending on it, so 41 dependents. And well, that's the first part of the issue that we're trying to solve. And yeah, 
I guess that's it. Um, before I uh, finish the demo, I got to thank Arth, Jeff, and Marco for helping me with this because designing this took a long time and a lot of iterations. Um, yeah, thank you. Do you say you had uh, some output that you, you, you had as well? Uh, yeah, I just put it in the chat. Oh. Oh, okay, okay, gotcha. Yeah, I copied that into the the community meeting notes there too. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, any questions? Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I think this is uh, was great. I think it's, I think one of the benefits of having, you know, a graph database is that you can find the find this information out, right? Like if we're using a single S bomb, or if you're running like a, a security scan, you know, this information won't be available. But because of an aggregation of all the data we're doing, you know, this finding out like, hey, what is that most critical dependent dependency that you rely on, and is it something that you know that you should be worried about? You know, like is it uh, is it is it maintained by a single maintainer? Does it have a low score card score or something, right? So all those kind of things you would probably want to know. Um, so uh, getting this output and displaying it right away for Guac, I think is a, is a it's gonna be a very useful feature. So thanks, Nathan. All right, uh, so next on the list, uh, any questions before we go forward? All right, so next is Marco. Uh, he's gonna show off a quick demonstration of the scorecard dashboard. And if you want to give a quick background into this too, Marco, as a primer. Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Um, so I think that bo both in Guac and, and also internally at Google, um, we've been looking at what, what sort of insights we can take from the data that we can have um, that we that is in Guac, um, sort of all the S-bombs, all the dependencies, um, and Nathan's work is, is starting to get into this, or is getting into it already, um, computing the critical dependencies um, using uh, the, num the, the frequency of each dependency. Um, but there's also other sources of information you can add to this to get better signals, such as um, criticality information um, computed from, say, the number of deployments or um, vulnerability information. Um, and all of this is our features that we're looking to build out into Guac. Um, and this will enable um, getting insights from the de dependencies, the open source dependencies that are in your software supply chain um, for prioritization, um, for, um, and, and obviously all the things that, that have already been, um, that, that are already a focus of Guac, such as um, Finding vulnerability, like vulnerability remediation, um, and, th and 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 other things like that. Um, so to show off today, um, I put together a prototype dashboard. Um, a lot of it is um, sort of grayed out um, to not show what um, the the actual dependencies of some of these uh, packages. Um, but just a just an idea of how. Um, some of the some of these insights can be can be put into can be displayed and formatted. Yeah, just I guess just to add a bit of color. The I think the the reason we're graying out is we're we're actually using real real data. So so we we basically collected all the container s bombs um, that we produced for the executive order, and that's uh, and that's that's kind of like the data set that that Mark was using for this. I'm sharing my screen now. Bear with me. Um, so first, I'll just show this. Um, it's this is a, a histogram of the open source dependencies um, for a specific S bomb, along with the scorecard score. 
um, or grouped by the scorecard score, um, and then some computer statistics um, that are here, um, which unfortunately you can't see. Um, but some of this information is includes a number of deployments um, and a sort of a, a computed security posture um, that is just an estimate of, of um, well, the security posture of the open source dependencies of this um, of the artifact that the S bound corresponds to. Um, and then another view is here, um, which is a scatter plot of um, sort of all the dependencies um, that are taken from a batch of S bombs. Um, they, um, and you can see, well, it tells you that the frequency, it's by the frequency and the scorecard score and the size of the dot corresponds to um, a computed criticality score, which um, some other information goes into as well. Um, so yeah, this is just a, a like a, a, a preview or, or one way that all of the information in Guac could be formatted and used to to um, to draw insights. Um, and this is the sort of the dashboard that's built on top, um, but the underlying um, and the underlying sort of queries that are used to extract all of this data is is what we're is something that we're working on um, in Guac, especially as part of the REST API. Yeah, so if there are any questions on this, feel free. Um, yeah, actually, I do have a question. So in your second graph, the size of the dot, is it based on open SF criticality score or like just a like criticality score made by Google type thing? Um, yeah, that, that's uh, it just like an an arbitrary function that that we that I came up with um, that uses data from a couple of different sort internal sources. Yeah. Okay. Just asking. Thanks. Yep. All right. Thank you, Marco. Oh, yeah, that's great. Uh, oh, question. Oh, sorry. I was at just a. Uh, my windows are all messed up here, so I, I couldn't uh, raise my hand. Um, I was going to actually just a ask a, a, a kind of a more broader question of just, hey, were there any like interesting challenges you had in trying to find interesting visualizations for the data in Guac? Anything that you think that like, you know, we should be capturing in Guac? Anything that you think that like maybe there needs to be more sort of associated data in order to kind of build out better um better dashboards and visualizations like that? Yeah. Um, so as I was developing this, not all of the features that were, that I needed to get the data were in Guac. Um, and uh, these are what we're adding to the REST API now. Um, and uh, this is really part of, part of the, like the work that Nathan was doing on getting the critical dependencies. Um, and I mean, second to that is sort of the like getting the requirements, um, trying to understand how this information is going to be used, um, and figuring out, yeah, really who the how the users of this of this data are going to use it, and and that's going to inform how to present it, um, and that's that's something that. Um, this this is just a prototype dashboard and and something that we haven't resolved yet or that wasn't in, in scope for this so that was another challenge yeah Brandon. Brandon. yeah i i think if i if i recall correctly i think one of the things that that i think Marco, you 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 did look around uh the block interface was getting aggregate information across things instead of like uh basically being able to have continuous counts of like frequency of, of of the library being used yeah uh yeah i think i think that was one of the things where because basically yeah i i think 
we're working on the, on the sub graph of it, right? So uh, filtering that out was a lot easier kind of doing the aggregates outside walk, but it, if I think it, 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 if it was included as part of the API, I think that could be used to it as well. Yeah, yeah, that, that was, um, the aggregation isn't really, aggregation of, of and gathering statistics isn't, um, isn't doable on the GraphQL API, even just like getting the number of, um, the number of results that are returned. Um, like there's no query for that. You need to get all the results and then like, grep to count. Um, and yeah, I think that that's like a very basic feature that, that Guac should support. Um, and it's, yeah, kind of what we're, it could be, in, I think it could be integrated into the GraphQL API, but um, the approach we've taken right now, and it actually might be as part of the pagination, but the approach of now that we've taken now is um, to add it to the REST API. So, so I think that there's, um, and I don't want to go do too deep into the, the um, uh, solution space rabbit hole here necessarily, but, but I do think that there's, uh, there are some mechanics in GraphQL to try and like take stuff like what we're talking about of like the count and those sorts of things. But, but in addition to that, I think there's, there's questions about how do you want to store it, right? Like, you know, you can go as far as like, Hey, actually um, stuff like the counts are stored in a completely different data store compared to the common, you know, blah, blah, blah. There's ways to store it as, for example, if we're using, you know, Ent and we're using, let's say Postgres as behind the scenes, there's lots of ways to store the metrics inside of um, Postgres directly. And then you can expose it via either the REST API or via the GraphQL in some way. And then there's like, you know, some of the more extreme things like, you know, we could spin up Spark and say, hey, actually, when we ingest data, it goes to a bunch of different um, potential endpoints for, for the different views into it. So aggregating um, statistics as well as, as like integrating into the, um, the centralized sort of graph piece of it as well. Uh, but just some stuff to, I think, think about as we kind of go through this is like, hey, um, if there are any interesting challenges around getting this to show up in what you think is the right place, we might want to kind of look at, you know, what we might need to, to change in, in Guac to, to make that happen. Yeah, definitely. I think this will become more clear um, as, as more use cases are developed. All right, thank you, Marco, that was great. Um, move on to the next thing on the agenda, Brendan. Um, he made a, some updates to the query node. So I think you're gonna demo that off and I kind of talk through it. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, I think this is the right one. Did you see my, my yep. screen here? Okay. Yes. Cool. So a uh, little bit of background on this is we have the Guap one query known, um, which is a CLI that uh, gets information about a package, uh, a source artifact, and basically gives you a little bit more information. And um, so uh, the, the, Current functionality of the bot one query and uh, as, as shown in the in past demo earlier is it looks at a node and tells you everything about that particular node. Um, and I think one of the use cases that that naturally come up is like what about this node and also additional you know the the things that it contains. So for example, if you Recursively, if you think about like salsa, right? This was built from these artifacts. Now I would also want to know information about these artifacts and their S bombs and so on. And so uh, the PR uh, that I included in the, the meeting notes basically um, is to to implement this. So the uh, the quick uh, the quick change here is really uh, we added a search the search step. Um, option 
So search that one will kind of be basically what it is today, right? You just look at a single node and just dump it out. So if we run this, for example, um, takes a bit to compile because I'm running it directly. There we go. Um, so you can see this is like console and I say search at one. If I do search at two instead, I should just really compile this binary because compilation for some reason is happening every time. Yeah, so you can see a lot more things come up and this is mainly because like we're looking at the specific um, uh, versions and the specific you know, um, packages and artifacts that the, the container, this console can, container contains. Uh, so this is just like two two layers deep. Um, one thing to note here is like it's a little bit verbose. Uh, I think the the general UI hasn't um, applied very well to the recursive search. So in the meantime, what I've done is I've I have this formatting script, um, which is this is a bunch of um, bash ox and sorts and stuff. And so if I do that, um, basically I can show you. I can cut it off. Oh, um, you know what? I, I have a, something that I already did, right? So I did search that zero, which basically says do it infinitely. So this altogether about 65k, no, 650k lines. Uh, we put that through, uh, we put that through the output, format it, and then we can dust it here. computer is very slow. Yeah, I don't know. Every time I go to video <laughs> conferencing, everything just like dies. So <sighs> I do have a pre pre processed text file. No, this <laughs> this usually doesn't take this long. I, it's just... You know what? Yeah, I'm gonna can I put it in the background? No, I can't. Okay. You know what? I'm going to do... Oh, there we go. Um, so I'm going to do some cooking show magic and show you... <laughs> show you. Um, this is the output of it, right? So basically, this is like for the console Docker, Docker Hub image. Here are all the certified vulnerabilities and here are all the different things. And then, you know, um, S-bombs, um, sauces, and then there's also we have like scorecard scorecard information here, right? So this basically gives you all the metadata that's available in Gua about about that particular um that particular artifact. So this way you can kind of do like that kind of that type of criticality score thing. We say just for this specific thing, what does my posture look like? Um, what if I want to improve this particular product? Maybe these are the scorecard. Uh, the, these are uh, the sources that I have to look at, um, and you know, if I have uh, basically here all the source repository repositories that I should be auditing and so on. Um, so another example of the recursive thing is um, also I did the same thing for the Cube API server, and so this one is even longer. This because Cube the oh it's not, actually not the bad after I. You look at. Um, so basically, you can see over here, you have the certified vulnerabilities. Um, over here, what you can see actually is the, the hash salsa. Uh, so it says, here's the S-bomb for the Cube API server 1.24.1. Uh, here's the salsa. 
these and you can see this salsa predicate is not actually for the the container itself but it's only it's actually for all the hashes only right so this hash over here says that this particular um hash has a salsa attestation uh and this basically is linked to this um local bin cube api server so we can see from here that um all, all the files within the container it managed to find that oh there's a binary here with a salsa attestation um and ideally you'd be able to kind of take that and look at, at all the binaries within within the image and then be able to say okay like which all, all the binaries do all that has also attestation so um but yeah the um that is pretty much um the 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 pr that that we have open for this um obviously i think ui wise um uh, there's a bit of improvement that we can do to make it more um more interpretable um but yeah i think that that's something that we'll probably do in the in the future pr or if anyone wants to 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 work on that uh, any questions uh, so is, is the goal to get some of this functionality into like the rest api so that it can be used elsewhere yeah yeah um i think i think yeah i think most of the 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 walk one stuff including this one should should be in the rest api um one improvement that that i think i i wanted to mention also is right now we are also including depths.dev as bombs um for for certain reasons we may not want to um do that due to due to um basically we may want to configure it so that we only get as bombs for artifacts and applications and not packages which i think makes a lot more sense because packages are a little bit more fuzzy and we can't know that it's an exact match before including S form in it. Um, but yeah, that's one of the other improvements I think we want to make. Yep. All right, very cool. cool. Um, any questions? Okay, all right, so last on the agenda, is Jeff is going to give us a quick overview of the backend test suite. Thanks, Barth. Um, yeah, so I'll give a little background. Uh, first of all, this is this information will be useful to those that are contributors and are looking to work on any of the backends in Guac. Um, so the 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 history of the testing on the backends was that uh, we implemented the in memory backend. And then we wrote a bunch of unit tests for that backend. Um, the in-memory backend didn't have any external dependencies. Uh, and so all the unit tests were uh, didn't need to do any mocking or dependency injection and used all the public uh, APIs to the backend so that um, they were essentially portable um, so that any, any new backend could use them. So when... Um, Rango and Ent were implemented. Uh, they mostly used um, copies of the the in-memory backend tests. Um, this resulted in a lot of extra work, where when we needed to do updates to the API and update the backends, we had to update the tests and update updating three sets of tests that were essentially copies of each other uh, didn't make a lot of sense. So um, let me just show you the uh, the tests. Let's see if I can figure out the Zoom sharing. There we go. OK, um, so just a quick overview of the, the new suite. So in Guac uh, internal testing backend, uh, we have the new integrated integration test suite for all the backends. Um, so I tried to include all the information in the readme on about the uh, about the tests. Uh, to run it, there's a Docker Compose that will run um, all the backends, like a Postgres database, uh, a Narengo database, uh, Redis, and TyKV. 
Uh, and then you can just run it with the go test command. Um, also, these tests are run in CI. So if we look over at the um, uh, the integration tests for Guac on all the commits, um, we essentially have those same same commands here. We use make integration tests, um, but that would run all the integration tests, whereas just running go test in this directory will just run these backend integration tests. And of course, um, you can use the run command to run a specific test. So if you're working on a particular uh, like node type and changing the behavior, uh, just go ahead and run this, uh, run the test on just that node type to make sure that your changes are are all working across the same across all the backends. Um, so the way the test works is there's a like a, a test main that runs all the tests on all the configured backends. Uh, if you if you want to write new tests, um, you just write standard go tests with uh, you know the, the funk test. There's nothing nothing very tricky except um, there's a a built-in function called setup test that will return the backend object to test. So just a quick look at that. You know, here's the test for the hash equal uh, node. And this, again, this is just written like a regular Go test, except it just calls setup test for the backend uh, to receive the, the backend interface. And then all the tests are run against this B object. Um, some more guidelines here about, you know, using, you know, keeping all the tests the same. Um, and then that's pretty much it for like writing tests. So they get run three times. It's kind of by magic. Uh, I'll show a little bit about how the main works. Um, so in the main, this is where uh, it runs through all the tests the, for each backend. This is, these are the backends. We have a skip uh, matrix available. So if we have some backends that don't work, uh, that maybe a new backend doesn't support all the different node types, uh, we can skip tests or if there's some discrepancies. Um, in merging all the tests, I found a number of uh, uh, thing, you know, differences between the three backends that we have right now. And um, so some are being skipped. Uh, we need to go through these and kind of figure out how to make the, the backends all behave the same and so that the same test will work on all of these. Um, the different the backend interface, like if you wanted to add a new one, is pretty straightforward. It's just to set up a get clear and a cleanup. So for example, like on the Redis backend, um, you know, there's just a regular setup to configure to 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 build the object. And then a clear is a flush. So between each test, um, each backend needs to support a clear. So the tests are written so that um, between each top level function, uh, the the whole back database is cleared. Um, yeah, and then again, the Docker Compose uh, actually starts up all the different services needed for the integration tests for all the different backends. So that's pretty much it. Um, in the future, uh, so this with right now this is running, but it's not. We haven't deleted all the old tests. Um, that's going to be happening very soon now because we don't want to be uh, maintaining four sets of tests. We really want just want to be maintaining one. So um, yeah, go ahead and take a look and see if there's anything missing or anything uh, needed to be updated before we go ahead and delete the old tests and just rely on this one as a both integration test and somewhat of an acceptance test suite for you know making sure that the different guac backends all behave the same. That's about it. Any uh, questions here? Yeah, that's great. I think this this was this has been asked by multiple contributors. Like, how do we <laughs> yeah. how do we test it? How do we get, make sure the acceptance testing, especially for the different backends? You know, I think people people have shown interest about adding other backends and like, hey, how do I know that I conform to whatever Guac says? Right. So I think this is great. So it's it's very helpful. Um, I'm actually going through some of these things right now as I'm updating uh, some of the changes. So it's it's much much easier to maintain one set of tests 
instead of changing three different sets at the same time. So uh, it's great. Uh, awesome. All right. Uh, so we have eight minutes left on the call. Um, so if anybody had, you know, you have some time for any questions, comments, if anything else, any, any anything you want to discuss, uh, we can kind of chat through it. Uh, can you assign me any issues to work on? Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We'll take a look. Um, I think there there might be a couple that are marked. I could be wrong as good first issues, but they might be taken actually. I'll double check. But yeah. So if you want, just just you know, you can ping us on the Quack Chat, uh, Quack uh, Slack, and you know, if there's something you don't find uh, that's interesting to work on, then we can we can uh, help you out there. Uh, I I will write a message on this Slack. Awesome. Thanks. So if there's no other questions, then we can end a little bit early, give seven minutes back. Thank you everybody for joining. And I'll see you guys in the next community meeting. Uh, we do have office hours tomorrow. So if you had any specific questions, you know, a specific implementation questions or contribution questions, you know, as you're, if you're working on a PR or something, come on, uh, that is tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, so please, please join if there's anything you'd like to discuss there. All right. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank okay. you.